The big winner at last night's 90th Academy Awards, Shape of Water, winning the prize uh, for Best Picture. Gary Oldman was basically uh, a shoe in. We had an Oscar, you know, I, I, my family's into it. Uh, so we had who do you think will win and who do you uh, want win. to win, yeah. think yeah. should win. So we had each, and Gary Oldman was one of the few that I picked should. Uh, and would win for his performance in uh, Darkest Hour, and a pretty good idea that makeup was going to win for, for Darkest Hour, too. Frances McDormand won the Oscar for Best Actress. I wanted uh, Sally to win from Shape of Water because not only could she, was she mute and couldn't talk, but she had to pretend she was in love with the creature from the Blue Lagoon. I mean, she had to be in love with amphibian man. Well, ahead of Martin Shkreli's sentencing date set for this Friday, the federal judge in that case has ruled on the amount he has to forfeit, uh, $7.36 million, uh, the judge says, which uh, she says represents the total amount of proceeds obtained by the defendant as a result of the offenses of conviction. Recall, he was convicted in August of three counts, including of securities fraud. Uh, he was acquitted of five counts that he was charged with. Uh, this comes ahead of Friday, of course. Uh, in that $7.36 million, the government says that includes $5 million in cash that's currently held in an E-Trade uh, brokerage account uh, that was being uh, held against, against his bond. They also say it could include such items as that famous Wu-Tang Clan album that Shkreli bought this single copy of for $2 million. Other things including a Picasso painting, uh, a rare uh, Lil Wayne album, the Carter Five, um, and potentially uh, his interest in his former company, Turing Pharmaceuticals, now called Viera Pharmaceuticals, essentially all all of that uh, is on the table, the government says, leading up to that $7.36 million they're going to make him forfeit. Well, Sam Nunberg, a one-time aide for the Trump campaign, received a subpoena from Mueller's grand jury and has rejected it, he is saying today. But he appeared on MSNBC last hour. And remember, this subpoena comes just nearly two weeks after he met with some of Mueller's investigators. And he told Katie Turr on MSNBC that after that conversation, he thinks they may have something on the president. Take a listen to this exchange. Do you think that they have something on the president? I think they may. What? I think that he may have done something during the election, but I don't know that for Why sure. Why do you think that? I can't explain it unless you were in there. Explain the atmosphere. Um, the way they ask questions about anything I heard after I was fired from the campaign uh, to the general election to even November 1, it insinuated to me that he may have done something. If you got that well sense, if you got that sense from the special counsel's investigators, why would you not want to cooperate with them? If you got a sense that something because happened. I'm not, I'm not interested in handing all my emails over that I've communicated with Steve Bannon, with other people, and with Roger Stone. I'm not, I'm not interested in it. Let's talk about some breaking news uh, <laughs> just hitting the wires this morning. A Seoul says that North and South Korea have agreed to hold summit talks uh, in late April. The two have also agreed to establish a hotline uh, between leaders uh, in an attempt to reduce military tensions. South Korea says the North has shown a clear intent to denuclearize and will suspend all weapons testing during the talks. Hard to even fathom uh, because we've been told so many times that that's the one thing they wouldn't that he wants yeah. is to be at the table as a nuclear uh, power. House Speaker Paul Ryan talking tariffs. Let's listen in. This is weekly news conference. There is clearly abuse occurring. Clearly, there is overcapacity, dumping, and transshipping of steel and aluminum by some countries, particularly China. Um, but I think the smarter way to go is to make it more surgical and more targeted. So I think 232 is a little too broad, and I think it's more prone to retaliation. And so what we're encouraging the administration to do is to focus on what is clearly a legitimate problem and to be more surgical in its approach so that we can go after the true abusers without creating any kind of unintended consequences or collateral damage. We've got some breaking news. Uh, we're hearing word right now that Gary Cohn has resigned. Meg Terrell's got more on this story. Meg.
That's right, Melissa. We are learning Gary Cohn, uh, President Trump's top economic advisor, uh, plans to resign. Uh, this is coming from the New York Times, citing White House officials. Uh, the officials, according to this story, saying there's no single factor behind his departure. Uh, but his decision to leave, of course, comes after the struggle uh, over the uh, the plans to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum, guys. So we are learning uh, Gary Cohn uh, plans to resign. That's from the New York Times. Today's top story, as we've been saying, White House National Economic Council Director Gary Cohn announcing his resignation. Last night I talked to a senior administration official uh, who Second. gave me an explanation for what happened here with Gary Cohn. Here's what the official said. Uh, said that this was uh, a mutual agreement here uh, and it was the end result of four to five weeks of discussions between Trump and Cohn about what his role in the administration would be after tax cuts. I'm told they discussed a wide variety of potential roles for Gary Cohn, uh, including uh, possibly a cabinet position. And you mentioned that reporting that he might be in line to take over for John Kelly. Cohn does not have a firm exit date. He's offered to help uh, with the search for a successor, but I'm told that he has not named a specific name to the president of somebody he would like to have in that position. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner. We begin with the fallout from the surprise resignation of President Trump's chief economic advisor, Gary Cohn. Stocks are falling as we speak. They're off the worst levels, but as you see, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is still down at this hour by 270 points. It's a loss of 1%. Investors clearly trying to game what that departure means to the markets. For more insight on that and what's really happening inside the Trump White House, let's bring in President Trump's former communications director, Anthony Scaramucci. Anthony, welcome. Hey, Scott, thanks for having me on. It's good to have you on. You know uh, Gary Cohn well. Uh, the markets are clearly on edge. What do you make of his resignation? Well, listen, I, I, I think the world of Gary, I mean, he added an enormous amount of value during the tax plan. He's a, he's a as you know from his experience at Goldman Sachs, he's a great team builder. Uh, he's incredibly smart on markets, arguably one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life on markets across the spectrum. And so he added a tremendous amount of value inside the White House. And, you know, one of the things about the White House, which we all know, uh, we serve at the discretion of the president. Uh, for me, it was uh, to serve for 11 days on the 12th day. I was no longer serving at the discretion of the president. And so I think uh, there was obviously a conversation there, and Gary decided that this was a good time to leave. I would say to market participants that they're overreacting right now. Um, because by and large, what he has proven over the last 13 months is that he's a common sense person on the economy. He's a common sense person on economic growth uh, and uh, American prosperity. And you can see it in the wage data. You know, wages are up uh, first time since 2006. And look at our GDP. Uh, we didn't get one quarter of a 3 percent GDP print in the last administration. That's eight years, Scott. We've gotten three prints like that. Uh, since President Trump uh, became president. Big winter snowstorm hitting the Northeast right now and, and right now intensifying outside of our windows. Uh, the snowfall totals actually increasing. Contessa Brewer standing outside in New York City. She's outside somewhere in New York City. Contessa. <laughs> I'm in lower Manhattan here, Tyler, and uh, we just heard what is for me historic. Thunder snow, not once, not twice, but three times in a row, plus I saw a flash of lightning, which I've never seen in all my years of covering storms. Cigna did it. It's acquiring Express Scripts for $67 billion. It's on the wires. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's see it. Cigna acquiring Express Scripts for $67 billion. That the uh, press release is out. Uh, press release is out. This was expected, of course, sort of. Yeah. I, I, forth it's on expected after I read that for me. No, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. This has been uh, in the conversation, obviously, Cash coming stock. after the Aetna CVS transaction, and all of this is... Uh, a function to a large degree of whatever you think Amazon is going to do or not do. So it's really. I mean, only that's, that's really interesting. Really you know, the idea billion. of like a, a, a pharmacy ben benefits manager, those have been the guys who have really been in the crosshairs for all of these issues. Yep. If you're looking at trying to find ways to cut healthcare costs, most people will say the easiest way to go after that is to go after the pharmacy ben benefits managers first because they are considered sort of the middlemen for all of these things. Yep. Cigna, though, looking at this as a way that they say will drive greater affordability and connectivity with customers and their healthcare providers.
They also say it should make health care simpler. This is just what you continue to see, this pressure on all of these uh, insurance companies to try and find ways um, to beef up their mar margins right. and try and secure a better place for things. And dissension in the ranks, 107 House Republicans signing a letter to President Trump urging him not to follow through with his plan to impose broad tariffs on steel and aluminum. Elon Moyes live in Atlanta with more on this. Elon. Melissa, it was a very public and very unusual rebuke of the president by congressional Republicans. That letter warning that broad tariffs could have unintended negative consequences for the economy and its workers, and instead it urges a, quote, workable, targeted approach. Now, that is very similar to the surgical strike that House Speaker Paul Ryan has been calling for. Also today, Senator Orrin Hatch spoke with President Trump over the phone about this very issue. So it is becoming increasingly clear that GOP leadership and the White House are no longer working from the same playbook. About time, right? That's right. Sir. Oh, no, sure, sir. You've been waiting for a long yes, sir. time. Yes, sir. Here you go. Let's pass him around. Thank you, sir. 313,000 non-farm payrolls increased in February by 313,000 jobs. The unemployment rate is 4.1 percent. Average hourly earnings 0.1 percent, 2.6 percent year over year. Uh, we also had significant upward revisions for December and January, a total of an additional 54,000 jobs, more than had been previously reported. Private sector in January added 287,000 jobs. The average work week increased. Uh, it's now 34 and a half hours, up one-tenth. Job growth by sectors, blockbuster numbers, construction up 61,000, retail plus 50,000, professional and business services 50,000, manufacturing up 31,000. Uh, job losses only in the information sector losing 12,000 jobs. The labor force participation rate is now at 63 percent. That's up three tenths from the previous month. The U6, 8.2 percent, no change from the previous month. We had an 806,000 increase in the size of the labor force. That's the biggest monthly jump since June of 1983. Finally, black unemployment down to 6.9 percent, an eight tenths decrease from the previous month. Some blockbuster headline numbers, but still not significant moves on wages during the month of February. And now we need to talk about North Korea because President Trump accepting Kim Jong-un's invitation to discuss North Korea's nuclear program. Kayla Tausche joins us now from the White House with more. Kayla. Now the fact that the president has accepted an invitation from North Korea, which the White House says the time and the location of which is still being worked out, uh, of course, is setting the tone. It's historic, it's unprecedented, and it's all the more surprising considering the no-holds-barred nature of the insults that the two leaders have been lobbing at each other over the last year. Uh, when this decision was made yesterday, the Pentagon was caught unawares. The Secretary of State was in Africa. And within the State Department, you have uh, an absence uh, for a nominee for the ambassadorship to South Korea. And you also have the chief uh, mind on North Korea who has recently resigned. So there are several vacuums uh, in advisory roles uh, for which to prepare the White House for this incredibly historic meeting, which no president has ever taken before. And a senior administration official said the president did uh, because there was an overture from the country and there was an invitation from them. It was an impromptu announcement that the president took into his own hands. Uh, he accepted the meeting personally from the South Korean envoy who delivered that message. He came to the briefing room and said there would be a major announcement on what he called the big subject. Uh, that is what we believe is the first time the president has ever set foot into the 
briefing room uh, and obviously wanted people to pay attention to what he was about to announce because it was so historic. Now to the big breaking story happening a short time ago. According to a report, Lloyd Blankfein is preparing to leave Goldman Sachs. It could happen as early as this year. Wilfred Frost joins us now with the very latest. Hi, Wilf. Hey, Melissa. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is there's nothing actually immediately new in this article for two crucial reasons. It says that it could be as soon as this year rather than stating it will be. Uh, and more importantly, says it is up to Lloyd Blankfein himself as opposed to being under so much pressure that he has to leave. So I wouldn't take the headline of the Wall Street Journal article as fact. That said, compare Lloyd Blankfein to his fellow decade-plus tenured CEO in Jamie Dimon, there is more pressure for one crucial reason. Lloyd Blankfein's two heir apparents, his two co-presidents uh, and, and co-COOs, do want to become CEO themselves in a way uh, that the two under Jamie Dimon uh, do not. And that means he is at risk if he goes for too much longer of losing more people like uh, Gary Cohn losing and he has to make a sort of decision between one year more or commit to five or six years more to bring on the next level of, uh, uh, of talent. The judge has just handed down a sentence of 84 months with credit for time served for Martin Shkreli. That's seven years. He, of course, has already served six months. Uh, that sentence applies to counts three and six, two of the three that he was convicted of. For the eighth count, she says she sentenced him to 60 months, but that's going to run concurrently with the other counts. So in effect, guys, about six and a half years here for Martin Shkreli is the sentence. She has also ordered three years of supervised release on each count, which will all run concurrently. So three years there, guys. Uh, the judge saying she wasn't confident that the minimal sentence of 12 to 18 months, which was requested by Shkreli's attorneys, won't deter him, guys. So a seven-year sentence for Martin Shkreli, credit for time served equals six and a half years uh, for Martin Shkreli in these three counts uh, he's been charged of, of securities fraud. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.